Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, it's Friday. I know you have better things to do. Uh, but you are here with us to celebrate this exciting moment, the beginning, the opening event of Barry M. Klein Center. My name is Chao Ning Su. I am the director of the center. I'm also an associate professor at the Department of Communication, Journalism, and PR. First of all, I would like to extend a special thank you to Linda Klein and President Aura Paskovitz. They are celebrating this moment with us virtually. So thank you. Well, to many of you, the Barry M. Klein Center might seem like a new initiative. But in truth, it has been in the making for the past two years. I mean, I still remember that early in 2021, I got this newsletter notification from the dean's office announcing the establishment of this new center, this new project. I was excited. I was very excited reading that email for two reasons. On a professional level, as a media scholar myself, cultural globalization has always been among my research interests. From the concept of global village to the recent sentiment of anti-globalization, I firmly believe that we, Oakland University, we need a platform like this to cultivate international perspectives to prepare our students to become global citizens. On a personal level, as an immigrant from Taiwan who has spent the past 15 years here in the US, globalization is not a political debate. Globalization is not a theoretical concept for me. It is a lived experience. So a center like this, Barry M. Klein Center, would invite human experience like myself into a meaningful conversation here and beyond our campus in the metro Detroit area. These past two years, I have been so fortunate to work with the best team ever. Um, I do want to thank the steering committee, Dr. Claude Bellajon from Art History, Dr. Sarah Chapman Williams from History, Dr. Ellen Epstein from Political Science, and Dr. John Carroll from Anthropology. Thank you guys so much. Thank the Dean's Office, our Dean Elaine Carey, Associate Dean Sho Shifley, Kelly Conway, Lori Posse, Tracy Stefan, and of course, Sandy from the event team. Without them, this event would not have been possible. So thank you so much for your support. Today, with the arrival of our visiting chair, Dream Hampton here, we are ready to jumpstart a full semester of exciting Barry M. Klein Center events. We look forward to seeing all of you very soon in the future to celebrate this new initiative with all of us. Now for our first speaker, a well-known pediatric endocrinologist, a respected researcher, and a champion of global education. Please help me welcome the president of Oakland University, Aura Hirsch Paskovitz. Thank you so very much, Dr. Sue. And the only thing that I would like to correct is that when you said that people might have something better to do this afternoon, and I just wanna say that I can't imagine anything that uh, might be better for people to be doing than uh, being gathered today um, for this exceptional celebration um, and our inaugural event of the Barry M. Klein uh, Center. Uh, I'm also just very sorry that I can't be with all of you in person. Um, I'm in Washington, um, where we are visiting with many of our alums and our donors um, these couple of days, and I'm so sorry that I can't be with you. Uh, Linda, uh, I'm sending um, special warm regards uh, to you. Uh, I want to start my uh, very few introductory remarks with a wonderful quote that really stands as a testament and a statement uh, from Barry as a way for us to remember him. But it really uh, reminds me that one person 
who is committed, dedicated, and generous can put his own personal resources behind his values. And I really think it reflects on what he meant when he thought about uh, this center. And uh, together, he and Linda uh, really um, made this center become a reality. And Barry said, I really believe that Oakland University is the most important higher education institution in the Metro Detroit area. More than 90% of our students come from Southeastern Michigan and over 90% of our graduates stay in the area after graduation. Our graduates have an enormous impact on the future of the state's economy. Because of this, I believe that it is incumbent on anyone with any philanthropic tendencies to consider giving to Oakland. And so that is what Barry did. And you know, Barry's vision went well beyond Oakland University. As we're talking about today, his vision is a global one. He understood and was inspired by the power of education. He also knew that education in this era and age of globalism means that challenging students and all of us to appreciate that there is a great cultural diversity in the entire world. And so because of Barry's vision and his generosity, now, investigators, scholars, artists, and all of us are now at this point that we're at the forefront of fostering an international dialogue that will allow us to open our minds and our hearts to the common struggles, triumphs, and challenges, not only of the people that we see before us in our local region, like Pontiac, where we're so invested, but really people around the world. Our center's collaborative and interdisciplinary approach is a reflection of our center's namesake and Barry's approach to life. He had such an amazing approach to life and I really wish I had known him. An approach that sought to transform the way that we should think about social issues for the purpose of being able to come up with solutions, humane solutions, solutions that are inclusive and that benefit all. Linda, I didn't know Barry, but I certainly got to know you. And through you, I got to know about Barry's spirit. And I got a sense of his appreciation for intellectual freedom for intellectual curiosity, for diversity, and for engagement. And so Barry's values, his enthusiasm for life, his drive to drive the rest of us now live on in the Barry M. Klein Center for Culture and Globalization. I am so excited about the program that we have today. I know it is just going to be so wonderful and engaging. And we're going to get to hear this incredible program between Dean Carey, between Professor Sue, and our wonderful guest speaker, visiting scholar Dream Hampton, whose wonderful and acclaimed films reflect the mission of our center to promote dialogue on the very important social issues of our day. So I too, want to thank our leaders. You, Professor Sue, for your leadership, Dean Carey, and our center's steering committee. And I won't go back over everyone's names since Professor Sue has already thanked all of you, but our leadership, our center's steering committee for your commitment to making sure that our center in our beginnings and in our future remain true to our mission. I also want to mention our center's distinguished faculty fellows, Rebecca Marcato Jones and Graham Cassano. Rebecca is studying 
how the early rhetoric of Margaret Sanger and the Federation of Planned Parenthood can be considered in the current socio-political context of reproductive rights. And Graham is leading a group of OU students to record oral histories in Pontiac to document local cultural and political issues. I think that Barry would have been thrilled to hear about Rebecca's and Graham's works because they're exactly the type of intellectual explorations that Barry was thinking about and what he had in mind when he gave his wonderful gift to Oakland. And I know that he would have been enthralled when he found out, if he had been able to find out what we are doing here today. We are just so deeply appreciative that one man with a vision and a passion for education continues to make his mark on Oakland University and the world. So again, Linda, we thank you for creating a lasting testament to Barry. We are just so very grateful. And on to you now, Professor Sue. Thank you so much, President Paskovitz. I absolutely echo the excitement of working with our two faculty fellows, Dr. Rebecca Mercado Jones, my best friend, and Dr. Gran Casano. I also want to take this opportunity to introduce our two students, two undergraduate scholars here in our event right now. Um, Tori Coker is a communication public relations double major, and Coda Grasso is a psychology major and sociology minor. Uh, they were both chosen because of their excellent academic standing their community leadership, and their commitment to social justice. So if I may ask our faculty fellows and undergraduate scholars to stand up, be recognized. Congratulations and welcome to the team. Our next speaker has not only demonstrated excellence as a historian, but her cultural and linguistic strengths, as well as her work to ensure the underrepresented have a voice perfectly aligned with the vision of the center. She has been a steady voice and a steady force behind the center since she joined OU in 2021. So please help me welcome the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Elaine Carey. Thank you, Chowning, and thank you everybody for being here. I'm really thrilled to be part of the opening for the Barry M. Klein Center for Culture and, and Globalization. And I'm also thrilled to introduce Dream Hampton um, and uh, welcome her to, to the university. So I think a lot of times with globalization, as a global scholar, we frequently think about kind of the laying of the global financial system, which we were already talking about in the green room, which emerged after the laying of fiber optic lines that shrank the world by, yes, allowing for greater communication, but also the purpose of the flows of international finance and commerce. But of course, we also know that this also facilitated the flows of culture, artistic and social and political movements that challenge us to reconsider how global issues and events inform the local and how the local also informs the global. Dream Hampton employs intersectionality to interrogate those fluidities between the local and the global. And her work continues to be in that conversation. So how does the global impact Detroit? and the Midwest and vice versa, how does Detroit and the Midwest impact the world? So I think this is particularly timely. We see proposals being introduced across the country that target academic lessons and the teaching of racism and related issues in American history in schools and colleges and universities. Last week, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, rejected the AP course for African American studies and similar efforts have taken place in 20 different states including an attempt here in Michigan. And this is, the legislation is prohibit or impede the teaching of what has been termed 
divisive concepts, which include slavery, Jim Crow, the civil rights movement, but also colonialism, imperialism, and genocide. History is complex, and Dream Hampton's work shows the complexity of people's lives while pursuing social and racial justice. Her documentary series, Surviving R. Kelly, addresses violence against women, but also how women have organized when few would listen. For example, Mute R. Kelly. Her work expanded the questions that, were, that emerged in Time's Up and the Me Too movement, but also what has ha taken place across the globe in the Uno Mas, in much of Latin America, and as well as women who have organized and physically occupied spaces on International Women's Day before and after, such as La Glorieta de las Mujeres que Luchan, that demonstrate, where women demonstrate against the ongoing femicides in Mexico. Recent protests in Iran after Masha Amini, a young woman was tortured and killed while in the custody of the morality police in Iran, demonstrates the significance of this type of work. And activists, scholars, writers, filmmakers continue to demand answers about the, grow the continued violence against women across the globe. DREAM has tackled many subjects, from mass incarceration, the carceral state, the school to prison pipeline, systemic racism, voter suppression, police violence, and trans justice, all topics that have global implications. In her recent documentary, Fresh Water, she considers the implications of how climate change has, Im has impacted the residents of Detroit. But this is a repeating narrative, and it's taking place not only in the US, but across the world. In 2005, all eyes watched Hurricane Katrina and its aftermath, thus a historical continuity as we watched flooding, displacement, and climate refugees who were forced from their homes and the places that they loved, in many cases, never to return. And Katrina foreshadowed a, that repeating narrative. We see the same repetition, Superstorm Sandy in New York City, as well as the rising water and the impact in much of the South and here in the Midwest. So her work sits firmly in a global conversation about environmental racism and environmental justice. Her work is timely and inspiring, and we are all thrilled that she is the inaugural Klein Center visiting chair. So Dream, I hope you come up um, just and join us very um, real briefly again, just to kind of get a sense of her work. Um, she is an award-winning winning filmmaker and writer from Detroit. And her most recent works include LA's opera, We Hold These Truths, as I mentioned, Fresh Water, which made its uh, debut at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit. Selected works include Treasure in 2015, the BET documentary series Finding Justice, and the Emmy-nominated Surviving R. Kelly, which earned her a Peabody Award. She has also co-authored the New York Times bestselling Decoded um, Random House with Sean Jay-Z Carter. I'm more, um, I like Queen's uh, music better, but I get it. Um, <laughs> her articles have been published by the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, Essence, and in a dozen anthologies. So please join me in welcoming Dream Hampton. Thank you so much. I was reminded multiple times to bring this microphone, and I still forgot. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so great to be here. So wonderful to see Shay Howell, who recently left the faculty, retired last year, but is the reason that I'm here today. Um, she told me about um, this opportunity, and I was just thrilled I applied right away or started bothering you before you even opened applications. Um, so it's absolutely my honor to be here. And I look forward to working with you all. Hi. Yay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I did turn it on and it's. Yeah. So, I think they're, yeah, they're on. Okay. 
So we have a couple of questions that we'll open with, and then we will turn it over to all of you to ask um, uh, questions, which you should have. There were cards and that were circulated, as well as we have people who will monitor the um, questions from our virtual community too. So I'm gonna open with the first question. And um, your body of work is, as you know, we've mentioned, connects to a lot of global issues through multiple lens lenses. And um, so Me Too, violence against women, climate change and racism. So I wonder if you could kind of talk a little bit about your personal and professional trajectory and what you think you're gonna do in the future. Yeah, well, I, um, you know, I, I think the personal trajectory, I don't know how unique it is. I'm from the east side of Detroit, um, a neighborhood that when I came home after being away for two decades, I went to New York University and stayed um, at NYU. I went to film school. And when I came home, my neighborhood in my city um, was pretty much unrecognizable. I grew up in a very um, vibrant Black city um, in the 70s and 80s. I graduated from Cas Tech in 1988 um, with my classmate, football star, who went on to become mayor, Kwame Kilpatrick, and uh, his majorette, chief of staff, Christine. Um, and so... I was watching, you know, the news and always kind of defending Detroit, which was a position many of us um, know whether you're a native to the area or not. Um, but I was so grateful to be from here when I was in a city like New York. I arrived in New York when um, the NYPD um, were full on um, in their terrorism of the Black community in New York, um, the Black and Latino community. I arrived after Yusuf Hawkins but and um, Eleanor Bumpers and um, Michael, I can't remember his last name, Griffith, no, he was a graffiti artist, but um, then Amadou Diallo happened and other things happened. And so um, I, along with neighbors and friends, um, at 19, we founded the New York chapter of a national organization called Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. And um, we began doing Cop Watch and Know Your Rights trainings in Brooklyn, where I lived. Um, even before Giuliani, well, Giuliani was in the, he was a prosecutor, but certainly when he became mayor, um, we had plainclothesmen um, who were, they, I mean, all of these squads have been. Um, you know, they were found to be illegal. And our organization actually eventually sued New York City to end stop and frisk. Um, so that suit came out of our organization. We also, um, at the time, because we were doing so much work in the community, we were asked by some of the founders of that organization, um, you know, wanted to, we were working on campaigns like Mumia Abu-Jamal's, whose um, time on death row had become an international political organizing um, tool against the death penalty. But we began to get a political education about um, our own domestic political prisoners, um, which was a revelation for me. I had like most Americans thought that that belonged to countries like Cuba and Iran. Um, and so we began, um, at, there was a trip, a youth fest, a international youth trip to Cuba, to Havana, um, where we met with um, Asada Shakur, um, formerly Joanne Chesimard, a fugitive who was granted political asylum by Castro in Cuba. And she asked us to um, begin using hip hop, which was, considered an organizing tool then, I don't consider it one now, um, to raise awareness and funds for political prisoners. Um, some of them were her co-defendants. And all of them have come home recently. Um, the last one was Matulu Shakur, who um, among people in my generation think of him as Tupac's stepfather, but um, was, you know, uh, spent a lot of time in jail for Asada's liberation 
um, but Sekou Odinga, also similarly charged, and surprisingly, her co-defendant, Sundiata Koli, all came home. So for 15 years, we began doing this concert called Black August. It actually um, is my second film, my first feature film. It's uneven. It's a documentary. But um, it was shot in Cuba and South Africa because we would have local like concerts in New York, and then we would do political education trips as delegations. It would include the artists. Um, so people, I don't know how much people know about hip hop in the room, but people like Most Def and Talib Kweli, it was always the same kind of actors. <laughs> Common came to Cuba with us and ended up making a song called A Song for Asada, um, which was kind of like the cliff notes on her autobiography. Um, but it was because of that delegation trip. And so we would do concerts in Cuba. Um, Cuba had recently decided, or after much petitioning by the local hip hop community, had been granted status as an art, um, which is a big deal. Um, I, we used to have all of these hip hop artists who wanted to defect and come to New Jersey, where they would like invariably, and I'm thinking about two of them, like be washing dishes or at Burger King, whereas as in Havana, like they give you an apartment or whatever, like you get housing if you're an, a ballerina or a jazz trumpeter, or um, after much lobbying the government, a hip hop artist. So anyway, we would we'd be a part of their existing festival. Um, and then we went to South Africa during, I don't know why I'm talking about Black August right now, but obviously I'm thinking about being in the spirit of, of Klein and this whole, you know, mission. I'm obviously a local artist, um, but I have learned so much from being in community and in work. There's times when I'm just a tourist. I just got back from Japan. I went for Christmas and I ate and I shopped, right? But there are other times when the work is far more intentional. So the South Africa trip was the um, the World Conference Against Racism. Do you remember W. Carr? when Colin Powell famously walked out because of the Palestinian delegation having um, the opportunity to speak. Um, and in my film, you see um, Black August, this tension of what it is to be an American, even, you know, as Malcolm said, you know, we didn't land in America, America landed on us. So as, as Black Americans traveling out into the world, and there have been exceptions, I mean, obviously like Europe in the 50s and 60s and 40s even is full of like these Robeson going to, you know, Moscow or James Baldwin or Josephine Baker being in Paris, right? We, we think of ourselves as being exceptional, but there is this kind of cultural colonialism that we were confronted with, that we were like ambassadors of. Um, on this delegation to South Africa where people kind of called us out. They were like, you don't make an attempt at the language, but worse than that, and we were like, we come from America, you don't want to know about our public education systems. <laughs> but worse than that, you haven't even made an effort to know our issues, our post. These aren't even the freedom babies, the people who were born post-apartheid. Post these were people in 2001, we were there, so these are people who um, were alive during apartheid, young people, and who were dealing with like land struggles. And so on camera, I have um, this young person get up in the audience and kind of call out the rappers that had created a panel. And so that question of like when and where we are practicing, even despite our best intentions, um, a kind of cultural colonialism is one that I think about a lot. Um, in terms of trajectory. There are times when a story is completely local, but I feel like, as you said before, it could, the implications are bigger. Like Treasure was a film that I did about um, a trans activist in Detroit named Shelley Hilliard. Um, her name was also Treasure. Um, she'd been trained at the Ruth Ellis Center to be a community organizer herself, found community there, um, and was arrested in Oakland um, County, made immediately on the spot. She was arrested at a place where she, at a motel where she sometimes did sex work over um, drug use, smoking marijuana, um, immediately made to do dangerous informant work and was killed within 72 hours in a really brutal way. So what, there was this way that, yes, we can talk about violence against trans people. We can talk about violence in Detroit, um, but there were these other intersecting issues that were clearly, it wasn't a stretch. I wasn't like, 
um, imposing my ideas about social justice onto her body. Um, her, she was her her death. Um, but also her life were like a living example of the places where these intersected, you know, um, the suburban borders um, that, you know, people who are from the area know how racialized they are. Um, this idea about decriminalization and hyper-policing of Black people who use marijuana, um, the idea of, about sex work, um, and then obviously this controversial idea, her story had actually been um, taken on by the New Yorker. I forgot Sarah's last name, but I love her work. Um, and, you know, as an example of one of many people across the country who had been immediately made to do dangerous informant work for the police that put their lives in, at stake. So that's like an example of approaching like a subject of, uh, that was quite local um, and trying to look at and again, not projecting, not hoping that there's this bigger story there. The story is there and um, trying to tell it as best I can, you know? Um, yeah. And sometimes, and it's easier. Those are two independent films who no one in this room has seen, right? <laughs> They're on my site. If you ever want to go check them out. Um, I had less control with something like R. Kelly, which if you've seen anything of my work, it may have been like one of that that you may have, someone might have had it on in the room and you were passing by for, so you got 20 minutes of like this six hour thing, right? And you're like, whoa, that's trauma. Um, and, you know, I had a lot less control there. There were times when I wanted, um, and I fought to not just have women on camera crying. I wanted, but I didn't succeed in say, um, interviews with the president of the, uh, R. Kelly's record company um, who um, had kept doing business with him. And, and not as, like, I wanted to interview these people, not as an, an I gotcha. Um, sometimes there are reasons like um, there, unless you're convicted, for instance, you can't necessarily, there are contractual reasons why you can't just fire someone or get out of a tour with them. And, and that kind of you know, those, that mendacity, those kind of mundane reasons were interesting to me to explore. Obviously, there are far more nefarious reasons also, um, but that kind of stuff I didn't get a chance to do. I was working with a network um, and I wasn't an independent filmmaker in that context. So uh, that was a long answer, I know. Yeah. Well, you mentioned R. Kelly. And I think it's fair to say that you practice as a reporter, as a journalist, as a filmmaker, but R. Kelly is probably like the one that brought most public and media attention. And I'm just curious, like how do you transition from this person behind the lens crafting the narrative to the person behind, uh, in front of the lens defending the narrative? In other words, like how do you deal with that intense media and public attention? Yeah, um, there were other people on the team. And um, I, uh, most people, um, I don't know, let me try to figure out how to say this. It's not necessarily fun to be the face of a thing, you know? Um, so there, there's not, like, there are people are, on a team or like if you know it's like the short end of the stick kind of thing <laughs> but I also um could take responsibility for every frame that ended up in the first docuseries there were two subsequent ones that I didn't have much to do with um but um so there wasn't a frame that in that that I couldn't take responsibility for you know and, and including some of the mistakes that I feel like we made um and so there was also the idea of, so a and &E, who owns Lifetime is a multinational publicly traded company. And so this idea of the veracity of it, I'm not saying this is true with everything, but in this context and with that project, we knew that there was like a 110% chance that lawsuits would be threatened and that there was a chance if there was any holes where we would be sued. We weren't sued um, because the, the, all of the work that we did was so rigorous. Um, 
But I've also been critical of um, the Washington Post when R. Kelly was convicted, asked me, I'd written, they'd, I'd been invited to write when he was indicted, and I wrote about that for Time Magazine. But then when he was convicted, the Washington Post asked me to write. And in Time Magazine, I was considering having done anti-carceral work way more than gender justice work um, since I was 19. I, um, I I didn't celebrate, for instance, the fact that he'd been indicted. I didn't, I think that there would have been, um, I'm not saying that he's not in the right place, the only place for him in this moment, but I absolutely have an abolitionist framework. And so I wanted to complicate that idea in time. And I did that, I hope. And, um, and I mentioned that, you know, none of the women who were in the documentary, for instance, asked when we, we asked them this question, um, it was one of those open-ended questions, but kind of like, what would you like to see? What would you say to him? And none of them said for him to go to jail at that time. It just wasn't their answer, you know? They weren't trying to protect him. But um, one of the things that I know, you know, having been Black my whole life, is that uh, an apology, a real attempt at restoration and restorative justice and restitution, even financial restitution, would have gone so much further in the culture, in the community, in terms of how it would have affected, you know, other Black men, first of all, and other, you know, victims of predatory violence, it would have just been so valuable. You know, none of those things happened. And part of that has to do with our justice system in general. It's like when you get pulled over, um, you can't say, I'm sorry, officer. Uh, you know, you can't, at the minute you admit to a crime, <laughs> if your parents had this conversation with you or you happen to be an attorney or no one, you know, that you can't even apologize. Even if you're really sorry for having like broken that speed limit, because that admission of guilt, um, you know, complicates your interaction with that officer. So if you scale that up, like they're actually in our justice system, once things like indictments start coming down, there is no space for an apology. Um, but anyway, so with, with Washington Post, when he was indicted, I was asked to write, and I think they expected something celebratory, but I was um, self-critical about our production. On our production, we had attorneys um, vet my questions, for instance, who are on set. They were in the control room. They were in my ear. I was wearing a headphone, um, an ear, um, headpiece. And um, they were vetting my questions to make sure they weren't leading. In fact, I had to um, play a position in order to get this on camera that was counterintuitive for me. It was counterethical for me. It was that of a prosecutor. So if a woman told me I met R. Kelly when I was 14, and I, then I would have to ask follow-up questions. Um, like, who knew you were 14? Who did you show your ID to? Who did you tell? The kind of questions that, like, Christine Blas Blasio, like, you know, DeFort, like, had to ask. Like, so lucky that she told that high school student, you know, oh, my God, I was just out with Brett and them, and this happened. Because if she didn't have that witness from 35 years ago, then she wouldn't have ever had a congressional hearing, right? So these kinds of questions that have nothing to do with the care of someone who's in distress um, were the kinds of questions that I had to ask to get this on the air. But while the network was protecting itself and the production companies by having attorney, sometimes more than one on set, we didn't have a single therapist on set, for instance. And so in the documentary community, there are all kinds of like questions being asked within the community um, about ethical practices, about complicating the ideas of, you know, these questions have been asked from the outset. If anyone here has taken a cinema studies class, then you've watched Frederick Weissman's To Decut Cut Follies, like to study fly on the wall. And we know that when a camera comes into a room, it just changes things. I think all of that theory should actually be re-examined. I mean, we're still reading Foucault and, you know, Laura Mulvey, where we should like actually in an era where, you know, maybe a camera doesn't change anything anymore. We're going to find out, you know, today when Memphis releases this um, brutal attack on Tyree um, and, and they're warning us about it in, in a way that's like alarming, you know, because we're all 
whether we admit it or not, you know, and I know that one of our fellows is a, a psychology major also, we're also desensitized just on a, to like the, the representation of violence, real violence, forget like the, our theories about Hollywood, I'm not um, Tipper Gore or anybody, but we're all like literally desensitized to, you know, images of violence. So something that was as extreme as George Floyd's, you know, kind of nine minute lynching was um, something that kind of shook us out and they're warning us in this way. So I'm, I'm totally afraid of like what's about to come out, right? Um, and I don't know how I got there, but I, I'm thinking about um, just, you know, this question of how we present and represent trauma in the context of documentaries. And by the way, in film, period. I mean, I remember when Slumdog Millionaire came out, I really um, enjoyed that filmmaker's work since he did Shallow Grave. And, um, you know, I, I enjoyed the film, you know? I think of Tom Hanks and that um, film about Somali pirates, which is such an interesting story to me. <laughs> I'll just say this, Naples, the mafia, Milan's fashion industry, <laughs> the Maples Mafia dumping poisonous dyes on one of the longest uh, coastlines um, where fishermen have been fishing for millennia, which is Somalia, um, and rendering that water dead is how we get Somali pirates. But Tom Hanks did this film um, about, you know, being white and like being like kind of boarded by a by Somali pirates and remember the pirate couldn't the guy who actor who played the pirate couldn't afford to come to the Oscars when he was nominated and not only could he not afford to but he um was prevented because of our states you know like when Mandela tried he was released from uh prison and he hadn't quite become president but it, I mean it was a couple of months before he became president that the U.S. removed him from their terrorist list right and so um, so he being from a state like Somali, he wasn't even allowed to attend the Oscars. I think about the kids from Some Dog Millionaire. There are all these stories about how they still live in the slums. I'm not sure that that's a bad thing, but I'm saying these kinds of questions don't solely belong to documentaries, but it's like, what happens when a camera comes? And, and by the way, this could be a pen, it could be a journalist. Like what happens when you go down to a state in Mexico and, and, and people start telling their stories, you know, like, how does our presence as, you know, anthropologists or ethnographers or documentary, like how, um, ethnographic, <laughs> you know, how, do, how, I'm sorry, how do we like, um, how does it change everything, you know? Um, and I didn't expect an outcome just to bring it back to R. Kelly. Like I didn't actually, R. Kelly, I'm old enough to remember when there was a trial um, in 2008 and he wasn't convicted. So I had no expectation of there being this, but then I became a part of a larger conversation about consequences um, and outcomes. And so now an impact is what they call it in the industry. So now when you go to pitch a documentary or docu-series, people, like there's this un, like, you know, fair and un, you know, I don't, it's just not that possible. Like, but these studios now want outcomes. They're almost looking at surviving R. Kelly like, okay, well, are you going to solve this quest, this docu, this crime drama that you're pitching us? Or is someone going to end up in jail would be the, the kind of outcome that they'd like. Um, but anyway, so in terms of my future projects, I have been asked to do a lot more of that kind of thing. I didn't want to do R. Kelly. I felt like I had to. Um, so I didn't do sort of the Epstein one and the other like four or five that I was invited onto after that, not because I don't think that they're not important or that their victims aren't important, but because um, I don't, I didn't want to make that work, my life's work. And in Hollywood, my friend Rami, does anyone watch his show on Hulu? Um, just an Egyptian family in New Jersey. It's a comedy, half hour comedy. Um, his next project is a, an animated film or series about an Egyptian family in New Jersey <laughs> after 9-11, right? So like, you know, that's what Hollywood does, you know? They're like, oh, hey, Tom Cruise, you, you know, you did your own st stunts in Top Gun, like, let's you know, let's throw you out of a plane in Mission Impossible. Like, this is like just what happens on every level, on my little nothing level and on Tom Cruise's level or whatever. <laughs> so yeah, well, it's a nothing level, trust me. <laughs>
to ask you a little bit about um, fresh water and, and swollen um, also, and just um, how those two projects also, you know, which are looking at water destruction and um, how those might compare to what, you know, what happened in Flint, what continues to happen in Flint, and also, you know, in Jackson, Mississippi, in this, and and really the the broader issue of environmental racism as well as justice and I think that what happened in Flint and what happened in what's happening in Jack what are let me not say happened what's happening in Flint and what is happening in Jackson are there's a more direct line connecting the two um, but environmental racism and justice is absolutely the larger umbrella um, which is just a kind of continuation of anti-black state violence and laws and policy and structure. Um, Jackson, of course, reminds me of Detroit. One of my um, mentors in the organization that I talked about, one of the founders of Malcolm X grassroots movement um, was Shokwe Lumumba, um, a Detroit native um, who was the mayor, went on to run a really radical campaign to become mayor of Jackson. Um, radical in that he would do listening tours. <laughs> that was super radical. Um, um, yeah. Um, I guess Mike Duggan was radical too in that he was like a write-in candidate <laughs> without residency requirements. Um, but um, what Mike Duggan and sadly what a lot of Detroit um, voters knew in the same way that South Carolina, South Carolina Black Democrats um, in their kind of sad and well-earned wisdom knew that Joe Biden would be like a safer candidate than say, you know, who I wanted, which was like Elizabeth Warren um, and the year before or the election cycle before I'd wanted Bernie. But um, in their wisdom, they knew that, you know, in Michigan, we knew that we were being boycotted. The state of Michigan had had a de facto boycott. I don't think that um, Bing, I don't know that he met with the governor. And I know that, um, yeah, it was just um, this way that they were waiting to do business with Detroit again. And so um, the way that Mississippi is refusing to do business with Jackson, the way that the state is in a de facto boycott and a stated one, by the way, we didn't, we don't have it as clear up here in Michigan always. Um, uh, but yeah, so those lines are clear. Um, and Flint has absolutely been talked about. I made fresh water. Um, I grew up on the east side of Detroit, as I said, and Detroit, you know, um, not as beautifully as like Amsterdam, but Detroit is built on a series of canals. Um, this is the, our legacy of colonialism. Um, and we like say Hampton Roads, which um, that Virginia, that Norfolk, Virginia area, which is more vulnerable to being say washed away than New Orleans or um, parts of Louisiana. Um, we are also in an area where the water is rising, but it always gets talked about in a coastal context. And Fox Creek, built on a canal on the east side of Detroit, on the south, um, south of Jefferson, um, I, people were just um, having to bail themselves in their basements out of flooding, you know, every year. And the city of Detroit, at a certain point, was basically directing them to FEMA, and um, it was the pandemic and I actually had just done R. Kelly and didn't want to do something quite as straightforward and didactic. Um, and my um, producing partner and good friend um, and fellow organizer, Invincible um, L. Weaver, they encouraged me um, to weave this, this thread that I was weaving in our friendship and our conversation and our ongoing thread, years long thread where I was thinking about memory I was thinking about basements, which is often where we store memories, um, especially in the Midwest. <laughs> um, and I was thinking about, you know, what happens when they're gone. And this way, it's closer to Venice, 
Remember that last really high tide in Venice four years ago? And they were like fishing out 15th century original compositions from the basements of the buildings. And we were all like, what are you doing in the basement? Like, <laughs> like, like you're actually like, unlike, you know, Detroit, you're clearly out of here. I always tell people go to Venice before it's gone. You know, I mean, this is where we are in the state as you know, Gracie Boggs and, and Jimmy Boggs used to say the, the time on the, in the state of the world, you know, like this is where we are on the clock of, you know, and so we're at a place where we should visit places that will be gone in our lifetime and certainly will be gone like in our children's lifetime, right? Um, the Maldives would be an example of this, a place that um, a country or a country full of like brown Muslims are looking for a place to relocate en masse, you know? Um, so we have our first country that's about to be a victim of that. And so I started thinking about Detroit. I started thinking about Detroit and my, my apocalyptic fantasies. I've had them forever. I end up on weird, like white supremacist, like prepper sites, like, you know, like Stormfront will have all these great places to go to get, I don't know, water recycling tablets and shit. And I, in that, those apocalyptic fantasies, Michigan is a safe place. Um, I don't know if you all know this, <laughs> and who knows if it's true, like about the rumors about Bill Gates buying like millions of acres in the Upper Peninsula. Um, I know that my uncle, who was a founding member of the Michigan militia on my um, mom's side, my mom's white and from Indiana. Um, I also have an uncle who was a great, great uncle who was a founding member of the Klan in Indiana, which is where the Klan was founded. Um, but he, his, his compatriots, his Michigan militia, like burnouts are all up in Northern Michigan <laughs> doing their prepper thing, right? Um, so anyway, I think about this fantasy that Michigan is like gonna be this place where there will be fresh water, where there'll be affordable land. We've already seen that over the past 10 years where people were advertising in Brooklyn, like come to Detroit, you can buy the house for the price of sneakers. And, you know, we had that like unfortunate kind of mashup happen in the city. But I was thinking of all those things. So it's a poem of a film where R. Kelly was an essay. But while I'm on the east side of Detroit, while I'm in Fox Creek, um, I, I'd already known about the work of like what we call water warriors in Detroit. Um, you know, um, people like Feed em Freedom Farm, you know, um, Myrtle, like they, they were already there doing the work on that in that neighborhood. And so then it became necessary to do a more didactic, straightforward piece. Um, and at the time, Rockefeller Foundation, this is one of the privileges of having something that people have eyes on finally, like surviving R. Kelly. They're like, what are you doing next? What do you want to do? And I was like, it would be really great to re-grant three filmmakers um, from the Midwest. So I have a dispatch from Cleveland, a dispatch from Milwaukee, and a dispatch from Fox Creek, which is a farm, which is swollen, a, a series of videos, three videos from those cities basically black cities along the Midwest, along Erie, Huron, and Michigan, and how they're all dealing with flooding. Does that mean we have five minutes left? Okay, thank you. You, um, I think Elaine and I still have a lot of questions, but uh, we need to also give the audience an opportunity to ask some questions. So I don't know, Zender, are you ready to yeah. read some questions that we might have? Absolutely. The first question is from an online participant, Andrea. She says, congratulations. This is a very exciting moment for all of us who support global competencies education. How can we support the center, especially the ones performing research in the field of intercultural and global education? Do you wanna, do you wanna answer that, Rebecca? Rebecca is one of the fellows. And I guess I can I can answer this question. Um, so as a center, this is very, very new. We have one aspect that is very research focused. That's why we have our two faculty fellows doing two very exciting projects. But there is another aspect of the center that we do want to cultivate a conversation about globalization and culture through a series of events. So for example, today's event, just the kickoff of everything, we have dream here to have this conversation, which is local, but also global. And throughout the semester, we have a lot more uh, that will be either virtual or uh, in person. For example, the end of March, we have Mike Chinoy, who is a longtime CNN correspondent, 
based in Beijing. Uh, he is now retired, writing this book, Assignment China, which is a book, an oral history of 40 years American reporters covering China. He's coming uh, to deliver his perspective. So that's another way for us to cultivate this global education and global conversation. So we hope, we hope that we will see all of you again uh, in our next virtual meeting or in-person meeting. That's how you can best support us. Or donation, donation, we will take that as well. In March 7th, we have, um, we'll have Sawatu Salam Ra, um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the name of um, her, um, her partner in um, the work that she's been doing to reform um, uh, the conditions for incarcerated pregnant people in the state of Michigan. Um, and I can't wait to have her on campus and we can talk about, you know, the implications for that beyond Detroit, but it's actually a hyper-local story that will, um, and that's March 7th, Tuesday on campus. Um, and we'll be doing other things. Graham and I are talking. I would love, I don't know if Annie is here, but I would love um, to like visit classrooms where I can, um, do screenings. I'm a huge cinephile. I guess if I were to talk about my trajectory, it started at DFT, you know, um, being at the Detroit Film Theater, um, doing my homework under the Diego mural. Um, this is before I would take the number seven bus, the um, Harper Cashew bus back down. Um, but I would, um, if there was a film playing, I would go check it out, you know. Um, and so in that way, I really was watching like international films as a 10th grader right here in Detroit. And so I would love to like visit classrooms and be included um, and all of the things. All right, this is from Tiffany who's watching online. How important was it to produce Surviving R. Kelly? What do you think it did for the African-American community? Do you believe this wonderful body of work aided in the charges finally sticking and R. Kelly being convicted? Um, the yeah, last answer is yes. Um, obviously, I don't, you know, prosecutors reopen cases. Um, and yeah, and, and the, in the end, in Chicago, in this upcoming trial, um, or maybe it just happened, I haven't been following, but the victim who refused to testify in 2008 because she was a 14-year-old who thought she was in love and in a relationship with her 38 year old um, predator um, didn't testify. But now that she herself is in her thirties and a mother, she saw surviving R. Kelly. She understood her story in a larger context. And she was a big part of the success of prosecutors in the Chicago trial after a New York conviction had already happened. I think that, um, and I don't know if you wrote that question, Tiffany, um, before I said the thing about how much more I think um, a restorative justice process would have meant to the larger community. Um, I think that there is that the um, his particular victims are on a journey to healing. Um, but it only and when I think of the community and and this is for all communities, I mean, women are disbelieved across the board. Um, there are obviously start, start racial and socioeconomic issues that apply to these particular victims. And we have that evidence on camera in, in the first episode of Surviving, or the first iteration of Surviving R. Kelly, which is the only one I was the showrunner and executive producer on. We had a juror, um, Eastern European, I believe he was Albanian and um, Romanian, I'm sorry. And he, um, he said, I just didn't believe them. He said, I didn't like their... Their, their colors that they wore, their earrings. <laughs> it was like a typical kind of like, you know, um, the ways that black girls are constantly um, profiled and shamed and disbelieved and judged, prejudged. Um, and so here you had a juror like reflecting back on who he was during the OA trial, honestly telling us that, you know, if you wear, you know, a bright color, a fuchsia pink, to court, then I'm going to not believe you when you tell me that as a 14 year old, you know, R. Kelly um, separated you from your family. Um, so anyway, um, disbelieving also extends to say what just happened with Meg the Stallion. I'm not a hip hop journalist, 
but it, it was a glance and a glean. It only required like the tiniest little glance on um, social media to see that she was, you know, as one of the biggest and wealthiest kind of celebrities in hip hop right now and in pop music um, was disbelieved, not unlike the victims that I had the honor of um, working with on Surviving R. Kelly. Um, so I don't know that there, I don't try to pretend like there's been some healing for our community. I always, I have been saying since I was 19 and writing about hip hop that, um, you know, bitches and hoes didn't start with hip hop. It started with the book of Genesis. Um, and so patriarchy runs deep in our community, you know? Um, I remember thinking, wow, that was a dumb bitch. She ate the apple. Or wow, oh my God, you know, she looked back and turned to salt, dumb bitch. You know what I mean? Like, like I remember just the the very first books of the Bible being litter, littered with women um, that I did not want to be, you know, um, and had very little sympathy for. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how to solve patriarchy, but I know that it's not um, something that we can fight on like the lyrics of 22 um, year old men or whatever <laughs> all right this next question is from someone in the in-person audience after the success of surviving r kelly did you feel any added pressure while working on subsequent projects how did you navigate the weight of so many new sets of eyes i didn't feel any pressure working on freshwater which is the only thing i did after surviving r kelly um i did surviving r kelly after you know um trying to to work at that level for a long time and it does produce like meetings to again do the same kind of thing again but then the industry shut down <laughs> so even if I was like tempted to just go and do a whole bunch more things like that it didn't matter because it and like the whole you know COVID happened and my world got small again and so I was in Detroit looking out at the Detroit River and driving around Belle Isle by myself. And I was like, I'm gonna just make fresh water. <laughs> but in 2019, um, Surviving R. Kelly came out in January, a six part docuseries. Um, well, in February, an HBO um, documentary that I executive produced um, called It's a Hard Truth Ain't It, which we shot in Indiana's Pendleton prison um, was released. And in March, a six part docuseries that I did called Finding Justice um, was released. Um, I was proud of those projects. No one saw them, you know? And that's kind of like the, the story. And it's not just mine, you know? Um, yeah, it's it's kind of like when people say, hey, oh, you're, you say, oh, I'm a filmmaker. And they're like, oh yeah, have you seen any? If I, would I have seen anything you did? And my answer to that is like, well, what do you watch, you know? <laughs> like, I don't know, you know? Um, but so, so no, no pressure. Um, I just had to deal with the fallout of that. Um, there were all kinds of consequences for that, but I don't consider myself a victim. It's just been like heightened security and um, different things that have happened. All right. Dream, I'm interested in learning more about your work in South Africa. What are some of the connections you observed between the social justice movements of the U.S. and South Africa? Um, South Africa was how I became politicized. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of people from my generation and certainly the generation right above me. And I say that in that I was, you know, a fourth or fifth grader in my underwear on a Saturday watching Soul Train. And Stevie Wonder was being interviewed by Don Cornelius. He used to have this really long microphone and he'd go, hey, Stevie, you know? And Stevie took that opportunity because um, he'd probably um, been giving talking points on his own political education by people like Harry, Bel Harry Belafonte, who was in turn working with people like Winnie Mandela and other so-called like wives of the movement, but the women of the ANC who were doing international um, tours and work um, and build and movement work to elevate the cases 
of people like Nelson Mandela. You don't know some, like I'm assuming when I say someone like Mumia Abu-Jamal's name that you know him, right? Or you've heard his name if you're of a particular age. These names don't become household names by happenstance. It's so much work. It is such a lift. Um, that's true whether it's George Floyd, it's true if it's like Nelson Mandela, right? Ma Ma Nelson Mandela, of course, there were 12 men who were arrested with the ANC. I'm not saying that we don't know his name for very good reasons, um, but um, that work, by the way, is so that that so I'm watching Stevie Wonder. There's a call to action, which always helps, you know, the call to, act, to the action. Um, was something that's being decriminalized now. It was um, divest, um, sanctions, um, and, and boycott. You know, these are words when you scramble them are, are like criminalized on campus, right? It was a nonviolent way to be in solidarity with people who were victims of apartheid. I'm not talking about Palestine. I'm talking about South Africa. I could be talking about Palestine. Um, and so, they talked, he talked about the companies that refused to pull out of South Africa, despite, you know, the um, story of apartheid and the, the fact of apartheid. And Shell was one of those companies. And I lived on a street called, I lived at Chalmers and basically the Ford Freeway. And walking distance from my house was a Shell station. <laughs> I had no idea what like franchises were, that this poor little Arab guy who owned this gas station had nothing to do with like South Africa. But I, was doing a science project. I remember flipping over that white poster board and running, boycott Shell, free South Africa. <laughs> like being this like one person boycott out in February in Detroit at nine years old. I remember like someone called my mom and was like, you need to go get your daughter. She out there. My mom was a waitress and it was like taking a nap or whatever before she began her shift. And she like pulled up. It was like, get in the car. What are you doing? Uh, <laughs> so that began my my activism right? <laughs> um and the people who were you know working um with me had already had an international framework the people who were my mentors they were black panther party alumni um uh, black liberation army refugees or um you know who like had made different connections, not just in Cuba, but in, but in places like Algeria, um, places um, like Tanzania. And so there was already an international framework. There was obviously the global, I mean, the philosophy of Pan-Africanism, um, which I'm so sad to see like retract amongst Black activists. We've become quite reactionary and um, nationalistic and anti-immigrant in a lot of corners of our movement. It always existed, but it's kind of getting a lot of voice right now. So South Africa, I can't claim to um, have some relationship with the activists that are working there now. I have an arts relationship. One of the projects that I hope to get made is actually an adaptation of a Bessie Head novel. Um, Bessie Head is one of my like spirit animals. Um, she's an incredible writer who was writing in um, Botswana. Um, I recommend that anyone read her books from the mid part of the last century, Question of Power, it's a semi-autobiographical. Um, but she also has When Rain Clouds Gather and a book called Maru. So I'm working with the South African team to make one of those books happen. But it doesn't make sense to talk about anything until it happens. Um, I, I won't say more about South Africa other than because there's so much to say when it comes to Black Americans in South Africa. Um, and not just the real connections, but there are all kinds of connections that are musical um, people have done like really great projects on like the kind of house music, house to techno kind of connection between Detroit and South Africa um, that are really interesting to explore. Um, but it goes back as far as Miriam Makiba and, you know, gospel and like the kinds of sounds that you get from South Africa. You know, I'm someone who loves music. And when you're in parts of West Africa, which I also love, you get this high, like ting, 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 like this kind of like joyous kind of high life sound, you know, that you'll hear again repeated in places like Trinidad. Whereas when you get to like a place like South Africa um, and, and of course places like Detroit and Chicago and the Delta, you get like this bottom sound, this blues, um, that we obviously um, connect in a pretty didactic way to suffering. Um, and so there, there's that connection too.
<laughs> All right. As a filmmaker who has made it, those quotes, what can you do to help support up and coming filmmakers? What advice can you give to those in the audience and online who have stories to tell, but maybe aren't sure about where to start or how to get their foot in the door? Okay, thank you, Xander. And there was a question in the room too. I'll be short with this answer. And it's just that I haven't made it, that every time that you go out, you're pitching and people get paid to say no. Like if you're talking about making it in the commercial business, there are people who have jobs, they make six figures, um, which isn't a lot in somewhere like Los Angeles. And the minute they say yes to something, because film is incredibly expensive, um, and that includes, we used to have all these, like the myth of like the, how the democratization of film because of video and some of that's true, but mostly it's not like the minute that you, it's an incredibly collaborative kind of way of working, which means that it, it requires people. <laughs> it's not like being a writer where you kind of, as my friend Greg Tate used to say, you write with your ass, which means that you have to sit down and just do it in focus. Right. Um, if you're a painter, you may need materials. Um, and obviously the quiet and the space, but you can do that like as a Ronin kind of, you know, film um, requires the minute that an executive at a company says yes, then millions of dollars get unlocked. So what they say 99% of the time is no. Um, and, you know, R. Kelly didn't like make it, you know, the lifetime I don't know how or why they started showing it a bunch of times when they have this third one come out in January. But when Surviving R. Kelly, the one that I um, made, came out, um, it only aired one and a half times, meaning that they showed all six episodes and then they showed the first three again. And the reason for that is corporate. Um, the people who buy commercial spaces in between the commercials of a show like Surviving R. Kelly, they don't want to sell their always menstrual pads with wings and be associated with you like handcuffing a girl to a radiator you know the 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 content is not desirable to them they don't want to sell their secret you know new fresh um smelling deodorant with you talking about women having to like defecate in slop buckets so um these are, I, I could, I don't, so I'm just like to just, I know this isn't a fun way to talk about film, <laughs> but um, yeah, there's a conversation happening right now about the Oscars and this actor who was um, nominated for Best Actress, her film made $27,000. Um, you know, they're hard realities. Being from Detroit in this area, we've seen all kinds of industries go under, you know, Um not all kinds, but the automotive industry. And so um, having worked in music, I watched that collapse um, and something is happening with film. And so there is no, I have no advice. I can say that um, if you're good at fundraising, I'm not, you know, um, then you, you should try to do your own first film. Um, I've talked about two films that I made on my own and I'm 100% sure that no one saw them in this room. So there's that also, you know? Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know. You have to love films. You know, one of the heartbreaks to me of Sundance, they're like, there are more people coming from different backgrounds, but like they don't even go watch the films. And I'm like, wow, there are films here that are never gonna get bought that you're not going to see. It's not like TIFF, which has become a quite commercial film, film festival. Um, there are films at Sundance that you literally can only see at Sundance. And people spend all this time like at lounges and lodges, like thinking they're networking um, and not doing the thing that should have brought them to Utah in the first place, which is their love of film. So like screening films. And so the only advice I have to filmmakers is to watch films. And it's never been easier, you know, to watch everything. Um, I know that you had a question. Okay. As te Cas Tech. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. What's your name? Okay, nice to meet you. Yep. And yes, and the family today of Tyree, the, her, um, his mother um, said that if you have children, please don't let them watch this video. Um, and Charles Blow um, talked about it as a lynching on mainstream news yesterday. So, but yeah, um, we have a very narrow idea of it that isn't one that's historically accurate, given the journalists who helped make it a national story like Ida B. Wells. I think we have room for one more question and then. Yeah. Sure. Okay. This, oh, one in the out. Sure. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> So they asked me if um, you're a student here, okay, about education and um, what I consider like the importance of it and what might be missing and what's being done. I'm not in I'm not in the field of education. I wouldn't. There are people here who I'm sure can speak to this much better than me. But I know that I see beyond you know what the dean was talking about with the attack. Um, as an activist and an advocate, I work with an organization called Moms Rising, for instance. And right now we're um, not just collecting stories and figuring out who's on the quote unquote front lines. I know that's an ableist term, but of struggle in Florida against DeSantis, but then who's anticipating the next thing? You talked about 20 states, but you know, it does, I'm not a genius. I'm not Cassandra oppression even. But it, I know that Young can campaign on so-called parental rights so we can expect this kind of stuff to come down in Virginia. So who are the parents? Moms for Liberty is this well-funded, I don't know if you know about them, but they're this well-funded kind of right-wing um, group who are showing up at, and taking over school boards and, and really um, pushing this conversation, which to me is an anti-intellectual one. People were identifying years ago about the war on expertise. Obviously, we saw that with people like Dr. Fauci. Um, and this comes down to this question of like the democratization, like what we were talking about, what I was saying about video, right? I still very much like respect, I mean, coming from Detroit, I respect the people, the union members on the set who are the sound and light person. And I'm not out there with my own little scrim like, hey, <laughs> of course I have ideas, but I respect the expert on the set. You know, in fact, film is quite hierarchical and um, in that way and very much militaristic. And there are people trying to reimagine that, but that's how it is, right? Um, so there's a both and. I mean, obviously there's so many things about this field. Um, I'm talking about education, like in the professional sense um, that there are all kinds of like movements and hard earned, like long time, generational struggles to decolonize, right? At the same time, there is, yeah, this very anti-intellectual, which is inherently American, but um, this, an this global anti-intellectual kind of war on expertise. And I started calling it like a particularly, I saw, started peeping it with millennials where like anything means all words, like, oh, I'm, you're fascist. Oh, no, you're fascist. Like, like fascism doesn't mean anything, you know, like it does, you know, it, it literally means something. And it, so Nazi <laughs> literally means something lynching, as you said. And it could mean something more than what you think it means, you know, but it means something, you know. And so I think about people like Guillermo del Toro, who, you know, is incredibly fixated on Franco, right? Like, and incredible, like, even a film like Pinocchio, he's talking about fascism, right? Like, and I don't know that he was in Spain for that era. I don't know how, I haven't read the interviews about how this intersects with his childhood in Mexico, but... I see it show up in his work all of the time, you know? And so am I afraid? I had a great education at Cast Tech. 
like, thank God, you know, alhamdulillah, like, yay. Um, I don't know what's happening now. And I'm afraid. I'm just afraid, but I try not to be led by fear. Um, you know, I know that rigor matters. I wish that I've become, by the way, I've stopped reading. Like I, and I'm trying to identify like what got rewired in my brain. Like there, you couldn't have told me when I first got a laptop that I'd have, you know, 20 tabs open on Safari and 37 open on Chrome. And it would all make sense to me. Like you couldn't have told me that my brain would be fundamentally rewired in that way. When I was on social media, you couldn't have told me that I could follow the stories of like 700 people that I was following in some kind of vaporous, non-important way. Like, oh, this one has COVID and that one's dog just got a costume for Halloween. And this one, you know, like whatever information I'm taking in, it has a direct effect on my inability to complete a book. And, and for that reason, sometimes I wanna come back to the Academy because you all are the only ones who are reading books at this point, or at least completing them. There's like a Japanese word, I don't wanna mess it up, but it means, all of the books that I have unread stacked on my bedside. Japanese have a word for everything. And like, <laughs> and that is my life. I, I bought Amani Perry's, you know, um, book that was just long listed for the pen about, you know, the South. And I hope to, you know, read the five or six other books that I bought last week, but I haven't finished a book in five years, you know? So I too am a part of like this you know, I, I'm, I'm a part of it. It's hard for me to finish an article, you know? And, and for that reason, when I work with organizations, I'm like, hey, this is the reality with no judgment. You know, I'm happy that the New York Times has the money, you know, to send someone out to do a story on Myanmar or, but I don't, we like that Al Jazeera 45 second video is, is where I got my information. You know, I'm still waiting for a good explainer video on Peru. You know, could I read? I'm sure like there are plenty of like pieces and articles and books, but you know, I have the myth of busyness also in my life. And I know it's a myth because somehow I watch Better Call Saul all six seasons in two weeks. You know what I'm saying? So I'll just end there. And, and I got costume for my cats, <laughs> there you go. right? So I should put it away and then read more books. I think with that question on education, we can conclude this part of conversation with Dream. Uh, we do have a gift for you. So.